In the ancient land of Israel, a young shepherd boy named David was chosen by God for a great purpose. Little did he know that his journey would lead him from the quiet pastures of Bethlehem to the throne of Israel itself. As David tended his father's flock, he learned to play the harp, finding solace in its melodies. But his life would soon take a dramatic turn when the prophet Samuel arrived in Bethlehem, sent by God to anoint the next king of Israel. How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Samuel looked upon Jesse's sons, expecting to find the future king among them. But God's choice was not the eldest, nor the strongest. It was David, the youngest and most humble of them all. Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. David's anointing marked the beginning of his journey. He returned to the fields, unaware of the destiny that awaited him. Now Saul, the king, was troubled by an evil spirit sent by the Lord. His servants suggested finding someone who could play the harp to soothe him. One servant knew of David, a skillful musician, and brought him before the king. As David played the harp, the evil spirit left Saul and he was refreshed and well. So pleased was Saul with David's playing that he made him his armor bearer. Years passed and David's faith was tested when the mighty Philistine warrior Goliath challenged the armies of Israel. Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. While the soldiers trembled in fear, David stepped forward with unwavering courage. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. With a single stone and a slingshot, David struck down Goliath, stunning the Philistine army and inspiring the Israelites to victory. David's fame spread throughout the land, but his path to the throne was fraught with danger. King Saul was consumed by jealousy and sought to kill David. They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? This was after the women had sung praises to David. One day, the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Saul offered David his older daughter, Merib, as a wife, hoping that the hand of the Philistines would be against him. But he later gave Merib to another man called Adriel. Meanwhile, Saul's younger daughter, Michal, had developed a deep love for David. Saul, pleased by this development, saw an opportunity to use Michal as a pawn in his plan to bring about David's downfall. He promised Michal's hand to David, hoping that she would be a snare to him 
and that he would fall at the hands of the Philistines. To further test David's loyalty and bravery, Saul demanded a dowry of 100 Philistine foreskins, hoping that this dangerous task would lead to David's demise. However, David, undaunted and fueled by his love for Michal, embarked on a daring mission with his men. They successfully slayed 200 Philistines and presented their foreskins to Saul, who had no choice but to give Michal to David as his wife. Saul, witnessing David's bravery and the Lord's favor upon him, became increasingly fearful and envious. Despite Saul's efforts to undermine him, David continued to rise in favor and esteem, proving himself to be a wise and capable leader. King Saul's jealousy and fear of David continued to grow. Saul's son Jonathan, who loved David deeply, warned him of his father's intentions to kill him. Jonathan spoke to Saul on David's behalf, convincing him to spare David's life for the time being. However, Saul's jealousy soon consumed him again. While David was playing the harp for Saul, Saul hurled a spear at him again, but David managed to evade the attack. Saul then sent men to watch David's house and take his life in the morning. David's wife, Michal, who was also Saul's daughter, helped him escape through a window. She placed an idol in David's bed and covered it with goat's hair to make it appear as if David was still there. When Saul's men came to slay David, Michal told them that David was sick. Saul was furious when he found out that David had escaped, and he rebuked Michal for deceiving him. David fled to Samuel in Ramah and told him all that had happened. Samuel and David then went to Naioth, where they met a group of prophets. Saul sent men to capture David, but when they arrived at Naioth, they were overcome by the Spirit of God and began prophesying. Saul, determined to capture David himself, went to Naioth. However, when he arrived, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he too began prophesying. Saul stripped off his clothes and lay naked all day and night, which became a proverb among the people. Is Saul also among the prophets? David, knowing that Saul would not give up his pursuit, fled to Jonathan and asked him why Saul was trying to kill him. Jonathan reassured David of his friendship and promised to find out Saul's intentions. Jonathan spoke to Saul on David's behalf again, and Saul agreed not to harm David. Jonathan brought David back to Saul, and David served the king as before. Despite Saul's temporary change of heart, his jealousy and paranoia would continue to plague him, leading to further conflict with David in the future. One day, while Saul was pursuing David in the wilderness, David had an opportunity to end Saul's life but chose not to harm him as he respected Saul's position as king. Instead, David secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe to show that he could have ended his life but chose not to. Afterward, David felt guilty for even doing that much and deeply regretted it. When Saul realized what had happened, he was moved by David's mercy and kindness. He acknowledged that David would indeed be the future king and vowed not to harm him. David and Saul parted ways, and David continued to evade Saul's pursuit, knowing that his time to reign as king would come in due course. Despite the hardships, David remained faithful to God, sparing Saul's life when the opportunity arose. His actions revealed a heart filled with mercy and forgiveness. Now, in the land of Israel, there lived a wealthy man named Nabal, who owned many sheep and goats. He was married to a wise and beautiful woman named Abigail. Nabal was known to be harsh and selfish, while Abigail was known for her kindness and wisdom. One day, David and his men, who were fugitives from King Saul, came to the region where Nabal's flocks were grazing. David's men had protected Nabal's shepherds and flocks, so David sent messengers to Nabal, asking for provisions as a gesture of goodwill. However, Nabal responded rudely, insulting David and refusing to give him anything. This angered David, who vowed to slay Nabal and his men in retaliation. When Abigail heard what had happened, she quickly gathered a large quantity of food and wine and went out to meet David. She humbly pleaded with him not to take revenge, reminding him of the consequences of shedding innocent blood. Abigail's words touched David's heart, and he praised her wisdom and courage. Abigail returned to Nabal and found him feasting and drunk. 
She waited until he was sober, then told him what had transpired. Nabal was struck with fear and became as still as a stone. Ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he sent for Abigail and proposed to marry her. Abigail accepted and she became David's wife. David also married another woman named Ahinoam. Meanwhile, Saul's pursuit of David continued, but David and his men remained safe in the wilderness. Abigail's wisdom and courage had not only saved her household from destruction, but had also secured her a place in the company of a future king. One night, Saul's army was camped in the wilderness, and Saul lay sleeping inside the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. David and his companion, Abishai, crept into the camp under cover of darkness. Abishai urged David to let him strike Saul down with the spear, but David refused, unwilling to raise his hand against the anointed king of Israel. Instead, David took Saul's spear and water jug as proof of his presence, then called out to Saul's guard from a safe distance. He chided Abner, the commander of Saul's army, for failing to protect the king, showing them Saul's spear as evidence of his restraint. Saul awoke to find David standing at a safe distance holding his spear. David spoke to Saul, questioning his pursuit of him and appealing to Saul's conscience. Saul, moved by David's words and actions, acknowledged his wrongdoing and asked for forgiveness. David, in turn, showed mercy to Saul, expressing his desire for peace between them. Saul recognized David's righteousness and promised to no longer seek his life. David, satisfied with Saul's words, returned Saul's spear and water jug, then departed in peace, leaving Saul to rule over Israel. This was the second time David spared Saul's life. Sometime later, David lived among the Philistines to escape the pursuit of King Saul. While he was away with his men, their families and possessions were left unprotected in the town of Ziklag. When David and his men returned to Ziklag, they found that the town had been burned and their families taken captive by the Amalekites. David and his men were devastated, and they wept bitterly for their losses. In his distress, David sought the Lord's guidance, and he was strengthened in his resolve. He and his men pursued the Amalekites, who were celebrating their victory and were unaware of David's approach. With the Lord's help, David and his men overtook the Amalekites and recovered all that had been taken from them including their families and possessions. Not a single thing was missing. Then a great battle raged between the Israelites and the Philistines. King Saul, leading his army, faced the mighty warriors of Philistia. As the battle intensified, the Philistines gained the upper hand and the Israelites began to flee in fear. During the chaos, Saul was critically wounded by enemy archers. Knowing that his end was near, Saul asked his armor bearer to slay him, but the armor bearer was too afraid. Seeing that he was about to be captured and abused by the enemy, Saul took his own sword and fell upon it, ending his life. When the Israelites in the nearby towns and villages heard of the defeat and the death of Saul and his sons, they fled, abandoning their cities. The Philistines, victorious, came and occupied the cities of Israel, plundering them and treating the people harshly. The news of Saul's death and the defeat of Israel spread throughout the land, striking fear into the hearts of the Israelites and emboldening their enemies. After the death of King Saul and his son Jonathan in battle against the Philistines, a man came to David with torn clothes and dust on his head as signs of mourning. He claimed to be an Amalekite who had been present at the battle and had found Saul mortally wounded on Mount Gilboa. The man told David that he had found Saul leaning on his spear. And when Saul asked him to end his suffering, the man complied. He took Saul's crown and armlet and brought them to David, thinking he would be rewarded for taking the life of Saul, David's enemy. However, David was <laughs> grieved to hear of Saul's death. He tore his clothes in mourning and wept for Saul and Jonathan declaring a public lamentation for them. He praised Saul as the anointed of the Lord and lamented the loss of Jonathan, his dear friend. 
David commanded that the man who claimed to have slain Saul be slain for his actions, as he had dared to slay the Lord's anointed. David and his men mourned and fasted until evening for Saul, Jonathan, and the people of Israel who had fallen in battle. David was anointed king over Judah first, then over all Israel at 30 years old, and he reigned in Hebron for seven years. During this time, he continued to show wisdom and skill in leadership, and the people prospered under his rule. David then led his army against the Jebusites, who inhabited the stronghold of Jerusalem. With bravery, David's forces conquered the city, and it became known as the City of David. David made Jerusalem his capital and built up the city around the fortress. He grew stronger and stronger, for the Lord was with him. David knew that his success was due to the Lord's favor and guidance. He continued to seek the Lord's counsel and followed his commands. And so, under David's leadership, Israel became a strong and prosperous nation, united under one king. King David sought to bring the Ark of the Covenant, a sacred symbol of God's presence, to the city of Jerusalem. With great joy and celebration, David and his people set out to retrieve the Ark, which had been neglected for many years. As they journeyed, David and his men danced and played music before the Ark, honoring God with every step. However, tragedy struck when one of the men, Uzza, reached out to steady the Ark as it stumbled on the rough terrain. God struck Uzza down for his irreverence, reminding the people of the holiness of the Ark and the need for proper respect. Fearing God's wrath, David paused the procession and sought guidance. After understanding the mistake, David redirected the Ark to the house of Obed-Edom, where it remained for three months, blessing Obed-Edom and his household abundantly. Upon hearing of the blessings, David decided to bring the Ark to Jerusalem once more, this time with great care and reverence. As the Ark entered the city, David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a linen ephod, a garment of humility and worship. Michal criticized him for his exuberant display, but David remained steadfast, declaring that he would celebrate before the Lord no matter what others thought. As a result, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children. One day, as David dwelt in his palace of cedar, he felt a stirring in his heart. He spoke to the prophet Nathan, saying, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied, Do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that very night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. The Lord reminded David of his humble beginnings as a shepherd and his rise to kingship all by the Lord's hand. The Lord promised to make David's name great and to establish his kingdom forever. God pledged that David's descendants would rule after him and one of them would build a house for the Lord's name. David was humbled by God's promise and prayed, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. And this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. David praised God for his faithfulness and promises and Nathan returned to tell David all that the Lord had revealed. David proved to be a wise and valiant ruler. Under his leadership, Israel flourished and the kingdom expanded its borders. David waged wars against the enemies of Israel, including the Philistines, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, and the king of Zobah. Wherever he went, the Lord granted him victory and the kingdom of Israel grew stronger David showed kindness and justice to the people he conquered, winning their loyalty and admiration. He appointed officials to govern these territories wisely, ensuring peace and prosperity for all. Throughout his reign, David remained faithful to the Lord, obeying his commandments and seeking his guidance. As a result, the Lord blessed him and his kingdom abundantly. David's reign was marked by prosperity, peace, and righteousness, setting an example for future generations to follow. 
King David remembered his covenant with Jonathan, Saul's son, to show kindness to his descendants. He inquired if there was anyone left of Saul's household to whom he could show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Word reached Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, that the king was seeking him. Fearing for his life, he came before David, bowing down in reverence. However, instead of punishment or harm, David greeted Mephibosheth with kindness and reassurance. David informed Mephibosheth that he would restore to him all the land that had belonged to Saul, and that he would always eat at the king's table as one of the king's sons. Overwhelmed by this unexpected grace, Mephibosheth bowed again and expressed his unworthiness, likening himself to a dead dog. But David's kindness knew no bounds. He instructed Ziba, Saul's servant, and his household to cultivate the land for Mephibosheth, ensuring that he would be provided for. And so, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, eating at the king's table like one of his own sons, forever grateful for the unmerited kindness shown to him by King David. King David reigned with strength and wisdom, his name echoing through the annals of time. But even the greatest of kings are not immune to the snares of fate. One day, when kings went out to war, David remained in Jerusalem, his gaze lingering on the city below. As he walked upon his rooftop, he saw a woman bathing, a beauty named Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of David's loyal soldiers. Consumed by desire, David sent messengers to bring Bathsheba to him. They lay together, and she conceived. Learning of her pregnancy, David sought to conceal his transgression. He summoned Uriah from the battlefield, hoping he would lie with his wife and thus cover up David's sin. But Uriah, a man of honor, refused to enjoy the comforts of home while his comrades still fought. So David, desperate to hide his wrongdoing, devised a dark plan. He commanded his general to place Uriah in the heat of battle, where the fighting was fiercest, and so it was done. Uriah fell, a victim of David's treachery, his death serving as a grim testament to the lengths a king would go to hide his sin. Yet the Lord was displeased with David's actions. He sent Nathan the prophet to confront the king, not with anger, but with a parable, a tale of a rich man who took a poor man's only lamb, a story that pierced David's heart with guilt and remorse. David confessed his sin, and Nathan assured him that the Lord had forgiven him. But the consequences of David's actions could not be undone. The child born to Bathsheba died, a consequence of David's sin. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. One day, something tragic happened. There was a prince named Amnon, a son of King David. Amnon became infatuated with his half-sister Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, another of David's sons. Despite knowing that their relationship was forbidden, Amnon's desire for Tamar consumed him. Amnon's friend Jonadab, noticing his distress, devised a plan to help him. Jonadab advised Amnon to feign illness and request that Tamar come to his quarters to prepare food for him. Amnon followed the plan, and when Tamar arrived, he sent all of his servants away, leaving them alone. When Tamar began to cook for him, Amnon seized her and expressed his desire for her. Tamar pleaded with him, asking him not to force himself on her, but Amnon refused to listen. He had his way with her and then sent her away in shame and grief. After the assault, Tamar tore her royal robe, a symbol of her virginity and purity, and put ashes on her head. She went to her brother Absalom's house, where he comforted her, but was filled with rage against Amnon. When King David heard of the incident, he was furious. Absalom, however, bided his time and two years later, avenged his sister's honor by arranging for Amnon's life to be taken. Absalom fled and was later allowed to return to Jerusalem, but was not allowed to see his father, the king. Seeing that Absalom longed to be reunited with his father, Joab, the commander of David's army, devised a plan. 
he sent a wise woman to the king, disguised as a mourner, to tell a story that would stir David's heart. The woman told David a parable about two sons, one who slayed his brother and was now in hiding, and the other who faced being cut off from the family. She asked for the king's wisdom in resolving the matter. David, unaware that the story was an allegory for his own situation, declared that the surviving son should be protected and that the other should be brought back, recognizing the wisdom in restoring family ties. Upon hearing this, the woman revealed the truth behind her story, pleading for mercy for Absalom. David, moved by her words, sent for Absalom, who returned to Jerusalem, but was not allowed to see his father's face. One day, Absalom became rebellious. He grew ambitious and sought to take the throne for himself. Absalom won the favor of the people and gathered a large following. He declared himself king in Hebron and set out to overthrow his father. David, aware of the threat, fled Jerusalem with his loyal followers, including his household and some warriors. As David journeyed, he encountered various challenges and acts of loyalty. One such instance was when a man named Zadok the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant to accompany David. But David instructed Zadok to return it to Jerusalem, trusting in God's will. Meanwhile, Absalom entered Jerusalem and sought counsel from Ahithophel, a trusted advisor. Ahithophel advised Absalom to pursue David immediately with a select group of men. But Hushai, another advisor, suggested a different strategy to buy David time to regroup and gather support. Absalom chose to heed Hushai's advice, giving David the opportunity to prepare for battle. David's forces grew stronger, and as the conflict approached, David prayed for God's guidance and protection. As he fled from his own son Absalom, who had rebelled against him, David encountered a man named Shimei, who cursed and threw stones at him, blaming him for the troubles in the kingdom. David's men wanted to strike back, but David, showing remarkable restraint and humility, refused to retaliate, believing that perhaps God had sent Shimei to curse him. Instead, he accepted the insults and trusted in God's justice. Meanwhile, Absalom, in his quest for power, sought advice from Ahithophel, a wise counselor. Ahithophel advised Absalom to publicly sleep with David's concubines, a symbolic act of asserting his kingship. As David continued his journey, he encountered another supporter of Saul's house, Ziba, who brought him supplies. However, David later discovered that Ziba had deceived him and had taken advantage of his situation. Despite these challenges and betrayals, David remained steadfast in his faith and trust in God. The conflict escalated into a full-fledged civil war, with David's loyal forces facing off against Absalom's rebels. As the two armies prepared for battle, David, torn between his duty as a king and his love for his son, gave strict orders to his commanders to spare Absalom's life. Despite Absalom's betrayal, David could not bear the thought of harm coming to his son. The day of reckoning arrived, and the battle raged fiercely in the forest of Ephraim. Absalom, riding on his mule, became entangled in the thick branches of a large oak tree. Vulnerable and unable to free himself, Absalom was spotted by one of David's soldiers. Remembering the king's command, the soldier hesitated, but eventually reported the news to Joab, David's commander. Joab, knowing that Absalom's capture could end the rebellion, gathered a group of men and confronted Absalom. Despite Absalom's pleas for mercy, Joab struck him down, ending the young prince's life. News of Absalom's death spread quickly, and the battle soon ended with David's forces emerging victorious. When David received the news of Absalom's fate, he was devastated. Despite Absalom's betrayal, David's love for his son was deep, and he mourned his loss bitterly, crying out in anguish. The kingdom was saved, but at a great cost. The once promising prince, whose flowing hair had been his pride, lay dead in the forest. The war had ended, but the heart of the king was broken, grieving for the son who had brought him both joy and sorrow. In the aftermath of Absalom's rebellion, David sought to restore peace and order in his kingdom. However, a man named Sheba, a Benjaminite, rebelled against David's rule, gathering followers to his cause. 
sensing the danger posed by this rebellion. David entrusted the task of dealing with Sheba to his general, Amasa. Amasa set out with the king's troops to confront Sheba, but he took longer than expected to gather his forces. Meanwhile, David's former general, Joab, who had been demoted by David for taking the life of Absalom against his orders, saw an opportunity to regain favor with the king. Joab and his men pursued Sheba, eventually cornering him in the city of Abel Beth Maka. As they besieged the city, a wise woman from the city spoke to Joab, questioning why he would destroy a city that was known for its wisdom and peace. Joab assured her that he was only after Sheba, and the woman promised to deliver Sheba's head to him. The woman convinced the people of the city to turn against Sheba, and they took his life and threw his head over the wall to Joab. With Sheba's rebellion quashed, Joab returned to Jerusalem, and David's kingdom was once again at peace. Despite the success of Joab's mission, there was still tension between him and Amasa. Joab, seeing Amasa as a rival, took his life and took back his position as the commander of David's army. David, now firmly back in control of his kingdom, continued to rule over Israel, albeit with the knowledge that maintaining peace and unity among his people would always require vigilance and sometimes difficult choices. Then, there was a famine in the land that lasted for three years. Seeking guidance from the Lord, David inquired why there was a famine. The answer came, It is because of Saul and his blood-stained house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. Now, the Gibeonites were not Israelites, but a remnant of the Amorites, who had made a treaty with Israel long ago. Saul, in his zeal for the Israelites, had sought to destroy them, breaking the treaty. To make amends for this bloodshed, the Gibeonites demanded that seven of Saul's sons be handed over to them to have their lives taken. David agreed to their demand, sparing only Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, out of loyalty to his covenant with Jonathan. The seven sons of Saul were handed over to the Gibeonites, and they were executed. After this, the Gibeonites buried the bodies of the seven sons of Saul, along with the bones of Saul and Jonathan, in the tomb of Saul's father, Kish. And after that, the famine in the land ended, and the Lord showed favor to the land once more. In the twilight of his life, King David called for his son Solomon. As he lay on his deathbed, David imparted to Solomon his final wishes and counsel. He reminded Solomon to walk in the ways of the Lord, to keep his commandments, statutes, and judgments, so that he would prosper in all he did and wherever he turned. David also charged Solomon to deal wisely with Joab, the commander of his army, and Shimei, who had cursed David when he fled from Absalom. David instructed Solomon to show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, who had supported him during his exile. After David's death, Solomon took the throne, and he began his reign by consolidating his power. He dealt with Adonijah, his older brother, who had sought to seize the throne. Solomon showed mercy to Adonijah at first, but when Adonijah later asked to marry Abishag, David's concubine, Solomon saw it as a threat to his throne and had Adonijah executed. Solomon also dealt with Joab and Shimei according to his father's instructions. Joab, who had shed innocent blood, was put to death. Shimei, who had cursed David, was confined to Jerusalem, but later executed when he disobeyed Solomon's orders. Solomon's actions were seen as a necessary measure to secure his reign and establish his authority. He showed strength and determination in fulfilling his father's wishes, ensuring that David's legacy would endure and that the kingdom would remain united under his rule. David's reign of 40 years was marked by both triumph and tragedy, but through it all, he remained a man after God's own heart. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and share.